together when you're not agreed. You can do lots of things together when you're not agreed. You can, well, I won't kind of enumerate them, but if you want to make progress, if you want to walk together, you have to be agreed. Uh, two can't walk together unless they be agreed. And it is wonderful just to kind of come into this context and know that hearts are open and many of us have uh, traveled the same paths, not always in the same order, but traveled the same paths and it's just good to be together. And uh, I thank you, um, Bob, for that song. It's um, I reckon it's over 60 years ago since I sang in times like these, you need a savior. <laughs> we used to go um, at the at the end of our Sunday, which was a very busy day. I had seven meetings in those days on a Sunday, and I was in my teens. And um, we used to go at the end of the day up to the center of the town, and we used to have an open air meeting, and that was almost always the one that we began with. In times like these, you need a savior. We used to arrive up there at what they call chucking out time. That's to say half past 10, just as the pubs were closing. Um, and it, it's wonderful. And inevitably, I think when you come to this time of the year, uh, you, you can't help but glance backwards and look forwards and just wonder. And uh, today, incidentally, is uh, Margaret and my, this is our 57th wedding anniversary. Um, so we we haven't quite we haven't started the celebrations yet, um, but um, he daily says the scripture he daily he loadeth us with benefits, blessings, and that has been our testimony. Thinking backwards, um, I, I want to think about something that has a link with wedding days and the implications of it. Um, and I want to take you, if you'll come with me, to the book of the Revelation. Now, I know that that's even that invitation for some, it kind of sets their heart palpitating. Um, I'm not going to go into particular lines of interpretation. I remember the one time I was in Canada and with the folks at Abbotsford and uh, Margaret was with me and Fred took us back to the airport. And for the whole of the journey back to the airport, he and I sat at the front and he drove, of course, and um, we just went through aspects of revelation and the way our understandings had changed. Uh, Fred came from a kind of a brethren, Christian brethren background, open brethren, I think it was. And often people think I'm from that background, but I'm not. In fact, um, I've only been in two brethren meetings in my life. One was in the early 60s in Cromer, I think it was, in Norfolk, where we stumbled into a closed Brethren gospel meeting by mistake. But that was an interesting time. And then there was a time, and I can time this and date this exactly, because it's 57 years tomorrow. On our honeymoon, we went to Keswick, and we went to um, the gospel hall there, and were very warmly welcome. So I haven't had a lot of association with the Brethren, but I've done a lot of reading of some of the Brethren books, particularly people like G. A., uh, G. H. Lang and uh, Vines and people of that kind of ilk. So I have felt very much benefited from that, but it was interesting to have this conversation as we talked and to see how in some ways our understanding had kind of changed um, for both of us and to discover that um, when two do agree, they can walk together and drive together and do lots of profitable things together. It's um, That was a delightful time. I think it was the longest time Fred and I ever spent together, but it was a very blessed time. And this is a special privilege to be here tonight. So I want to look at the book of Revelation um, and with, with a particular aspect of it, which is to look at one of these messages to the seven churches. It's an amazing book. It's full of symbols. Um, if you do this, if you probably best do this on a computer if you've got the software with it, rather than do it with a pen and paper. But if you go through the book of Revelation and look for words like as or like, 
you'll find I think there are close to a hundred times. Sometimes within a space of maybe five verses or so, you'll have ten, ten times where it will speak and use the word of like, similarity. It's like this. And so much of the book of the Revelation is not to be taken literally because it is all to do with things which are like this and that as that. And if you get your literal mixed up with your symbolic, it can really ensnare you into all kinds of ways. That's my conviction. Anyway, so I want to start uh, with this book. And it's, it really is amazing how John begins it. Let me put you, first of all, a little bit in the historical context. When I'm doing Bible teaching and kind of doing series and things, I often use a little mantra, which I call context, context, context. And by that, I mean this. As God chooses to, God can use his book in any way he wants to. Uh, he can take bits out of context. He can apply bits in ways that probably nobody ever thought to apply it before. I've got a few funny stories of places where that happened to different individuals. But it's his right. It's his prerogative. He, he can do that. But when it comes to Bible teaching and we're kind of trying to open out the scriptures, uh, we don't really have that kind of luxury of just kind of taking a verse and making it mean anything that we choose to make. We really do then need to kind of look at the context because context changes everything. You know, words, in a sense, don't have meeting, meaning unless you can put them into a context. If you don't know what the context is, you, you, you can't really understand what the word means. Often words uh, um, are context sensitive and they mean quite different things in different contexts. And the other thing is that many Greek words and many English words have what they call a, uh, they call it a semantic range. That really means that they have a one word has a bundle of meanings, like with us. I might use the word run, and I might say, well, the train is running late. I might say, um, my nose is running. If I was a lady, I might say, my ladder's running. I, but you need the context to know what it means. And that's why when we can, it isn't always possible, but when we can, we need to sort of try and put these things into the context. And I'm convinced that the book of Revelation was written round about 95 AD. Now that's significant because it's 25 years after the destruction of the temple. Um, it's also significant for other reasons because you can see, maybe let me interrupt myself, I do that regularly, um, and say this, that Christians generally, I think, believe in what they call progressive revelation. That's to say that as you go through the Bible, without contradicting himself, God adds truth to truth, and it builds slowly. And sometimes things come into focus that really you never had any clue about earlier on, but it goes on. So it, it, it never contradicts itself, but it often does open out in different ways. And I think that happens here too. And I think it happened in the hearts of the people who were God's instruments in bringing us the scriptures, people like Paul and Peter, uh, people like this who uh, brought these things, John, of course. And when you look at the end of their lives, towards the end of the life, we've got books which indicate something about the way that they were thinking, and God has enshrined it and preserved it for us. But they were thinking towards the end of their life, and you, you know that Paul knew that his time was short, and Peter knew that his time was short. And John, who was a very old man by the time he, he wrote the, received the revelation, um, they're towards the end. And I think it's almost inevitable as you, as you get towards what appears to be the autumn of life, to say the least. Um, at that time, it's, it's inevitable that we kind of look backwards a little bit and kind of wonder and look forwards. And then what do we do? Um, I noticed that uh, Peter added that little saying of, um, of uh, Oswald Chambers, although I can tell from the way he quoted it, he's using the modernized version because they've changed it. <laughs> the modernized version says something about um, leaving behind the irreversible 
things and moving forward with boldness into the new things. But it's interesting that um, the older version, the authentic Oswald Chambers, actually doesn't use the word reversible. He uses the word irreparable. Uh, he says there are things in our lives that can't be repaired. And we have to leave them on the bosom of our Savior. And we just leave them there. And then with confidence in him, we move forward. So we don't get into those, that deadly kind of downward spiral of in, 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 inspection where we're kind of thinking, well, I never was any good and I'm not likely to be any better either. But there are times when it really is good to pause and just have a moment in the presence of God. Don't ever do this outside God's presence, because if you do this, you will be crippled by, in, in, I can't think of the word, when, when you think inwards of yourself and you go deeper and deeper and deeper. Don't ever do this unless you're in the presence of God. But in the presence of God, you can think and let God remind you of the things he wants to remind you of. We shall find that um, God has a particular kind of a memory. and We'll see it in the Old Testament, if I go in that direction, and in the New Testament, that God has this memory because he is almighty, and we are not. Because he is almighty, he has absolute control over his memory. I'm sure there are times you wish you had absolute control of your memory and wish there were things that you could kind of seal off forever and they were never come visiting. You don't want to rerun any of those tapes. God says concerning the foundation of the new covenant, their sins, your sins and your iniquities, I will remember no more. He does not say I'll forget because forgetting is a failure that affects people who are getting older, as you've, I've, I've illustrated tonight already. But God doesn't forget. But God has absolute control of his memory, and there are things that he refuses to bring to mind. And that's a great assurance. So we can always come, knowing that he's not going to be reminded by any enemy that we might have, because God has made a decision that there are certain things that he will not remember. Well, let's have a look at this here then. So this is AD 95 about that time. And when we look at the writings of Paul and Peter from about AD 65, 30 years previously, we discover that they are both warning of perilous times that are coming. Both of them. <clears throat> God has revealed to them that the churches are about to go through a season of great trial, uh, precious tribulations, the Bible uses that word. John will use this word here in, in, um, in the Revelation. Um, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9, he says, uh, he introduces himself to the people he's writing to, and he says, I, John, who am also your brother and companion in tribulation. And that word tribulation really comes from a word that means pressure pressure there are all kinds of pressures that come upon our lives and some people try to devise means whereby they can live a life where they have no pressures uh, chill they say <laughs> chill but don't don't feel any pressure from this at all well brothers and sisters we were actually designed to live in pressure uh, you and i probably came into the world as a result of intense pressure um, and God has ordained that we shall live our lives under the pressures of the atmosphere and all kinds of things. The danger, of course, is if the pressures are out of control. But if we are in God control, the pressures that come to us are never out of control. They're always his pressures. I'm tempted to go off now on a tangent, but I'm going to resist the temptation and try and stick to this. So this is what he says. He says he's a companion in tribulation. A companion is the word, almost the word koinonia. It's the people who he's in fellowship with. It's his partners. He says, I'm your brother and I'm a partner with you in pressures and in the kingdom and patience. And the word patience always means patient endurance in the New Testament. So it's not patience 
just on the off chance that that bus might come along one hour soon. It, this, this is patient endurance. It technically means to stay under a burden that God has put on your shoulders. And he says, this is, <coughs> he then puts himself in context. And he says this, he's in tribulation, he's in the kingdom and patient endurance of Jesus Christ, he's in the isle that's called Patmos, and that was a kind of, maybe it was a kind of a house arrest, we don't really know. Um, he was an old man, so I doubt that he'd been put to heavy labor by this time. But the thing that must have grieved him more than anything else was that in natural terms, he was cut off from his brethren. It seems that this time of his life, he was living in the western part of what we would now call Turkey in the Roman province of Asia. And um, he has links with several churches there. And the book of the Revelation was originally written to them. So we are kind of looking over their shoulder and seeing what God had to say to them. But the wonderful thing is that God tells us that, in a sense, although these letters are particularly and uniquely applicable to them, yet at the same time, he says to each one of them, everyone who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So if your ears are open to hear what God is saying to you, you will hear something that God intended for you, even though the first recipients of it were some folks in a place called Ephesus all those years ago. But he wasn't just in tribulation, and he wasn't just in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. He wasn't just in the Isle of Patmos. He goes on to say, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And he had this experience where he was supremely conscious of the the spirit you remember peter had a time when uh, he was in a trance of sorts um on the roof and god revealed deep things to him and if we go farther back we discover that there was to adam it was re it, it was when he was in a deep sleep a deep trance that god actually brought forth his wife and abraham when god actually made a covenant in that passage, Abraham was a sleeping partner. He never entered that particular um, covenant avenue of death. Um, but there are these times when these men were uniquely conscious of the Spirit of God and knew that God was saying so. Sometimes it wasn't just God's people. Sometimes kings did this. Uh, they had things that troubled them in the night. And I wonder, this is just speculation, I wonder had John been thinking about the churches back home in Asia Minor? Was he wondering how things were developing, how things were growing? Um, did he have any input into these still as an old man? They were certainly very much on his heart. And God begins to reveal things to him. And you discover that these seven churches, which are named, well, really, five of them are in desperate straits and with a couple of them you look at this and you think how could this ever happen to a christian church were these christian churches well jesus identifies them as so he sends letters to these seven churches that are in asia and with each one they're in a unique situation and it's it it comes through in an amazing way just how well you know how with each one of these he begins by saying i know that's that's a wonderful thing it's jesus who's speaking he says i know and he always knows <laughs> uh, he himself knew what he would do do you remember that quotation at, at the time when they were looking to feed all those thousands of people and they asked questions about what they would do but it says he himself knew what he would do. He always knows. And that's the wonderful thing that he isn't guessing. He isn't sort of trying to put things together, <coughs> come to deductions, and then find a remedy. He knows. He knows. And he, he, he shows this way of knowing in a way which is really very, very powerful, very wonderful. Um, it goes on to, to say this. This is some... Um, Revelation chapter 1 
and verse 12. John hears a voice. And as he turns to see the voice, the thing that actually first captures his attention is not the speaker, but it's the context in which the speaker is at that present time. Let me read it to you so you can make sense of what I'm trying to say. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I, seven, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now, wouldn't you have expected it to say, I turned and I saw Christ, I saw the one who'd come to speak. But it's interesting, he turned, and God puts him in a context. He, 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 he turns, and the first thing he registers is he's back in the area of Asia Minor. He's, he's seeing something in signs and symbols. He's not seeing the geography of them. He's not seeing the houses that they met in or what that is. But he's seeing something else, and he's seeing that there are seven golden lampstands. And here we go, because it's just absolutely full of symbolism. But gold, nearly always in the scriptures, in the kind of context, in these things that, that are called apocalyptic scriptures, signifies something that God has done, something that has had its origin in God. So you've got seven lampstands here, and they're gold. They're, God has made these things. These are not the devices of men. This is God's plan. And there are seven of them. Now, in the old covenant, there was just one lampstand. And the one lampstand had one foot, and it stood in one geographical location, and it had seven branches, and it was linked. It was linked organizationally. It was linked hierarchically. It was linked as regards the ministries that operated. It was just one lampstand. But now John sees something which is not one lampstand, but seven lampstands, because each one of these is an individual planting of God himself. Each one of these, oh, yeah, I'm sure he used Paul at Ephesus and other people at other places. Um, Col Colossae is close to Laodicea, and Epaphroditus and people like that would be involved in these things. But ultimately, these are gold. This, this, is, this is the work of God to have brought these seven lampstands into being. And notice, and this is where pedantry can come to your aid sometimes, um, that these are not candlesticks. That is a real travesty that our beloved old King James Version used the word candlesticks. There are no candles in the Bible. Uh, candles are kind of, what are they? They're kind of condensations or they are masses of fat which have a limited life expectancy and usefulness and burn away. And when they get to the end of it, it'll fill your nose with an obnoxious smell. There aren't any of those. You don't have candles here. What you have is lamps. And the lamp is a container that has a wick in it. And in the Old Covenant, there's some vivid pictures. It was, Mo, it was Aaron as the high priest who had supreme responsibility for looking after the well-being of the seven-branched lampstand with the one foot. Others brought him supplies. They brought him fresh oil, fresh pure oil. Um, and he trimmed the wicks, but it was his job and his alone Brothers and sisters, we have a high priest, and ultimately it is his and his alone role to trim the wicks and to supply the oil for the lampstand. What he has made, he will sustain. That's his promise. From mother's womb to gray hairs, what he has made, he will sustain. And he has brought these things into being, these seven lampstands, which are burning. Let me read on. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke of me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. 
And in the midst of the seven lampstands, notice he's setting a context here. Not above them, not to one side of them, not in some kind of hierarchy with Ephesus at the top and everything trickling down to the also around at the bottom. In the midst of the seven lampstands, there's one like the Son of Man. There's one of the first likes of those um, 60 or 70 so you get in the book of Revelation clothed with the garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. This is only kings and priests wore garments that went right down to your ankles. And although this one is recognized as the king of kings, in this role, he seems to be functioning as a priest and he's moving as a high priest among the lampstands. He is available to trim. Um, and if you don't trim the wicks, you get a horrible smell. Um, I'm not a scientist. I, I would have liked to have been one, but I'm I'm curious. So from time to time, I I do scientific experiments, and you know that there is this wonderful promise that God would not quench a smoking flax. And I thought, well, I wonder what a smoking flax smells like. So I managed to get a facsimile of one of these little kind of Roman oil lamps and we put in some super virgin oil and I put a wick into it and um, we lit it and then I kind of part extinguished it and the smell was terrible. You could not ignore it. It was acrid. It got up your nose. You just wanted to walk away from it. And yet God says the smoking flax, I won't quench it. And the reed, I won't break. Let me tell you, let me lighten this just for a moment to you. Our dear brother Norman, who is so ill at the present time, I visited India with him on one occasion. And we were sitting chatting at a certain time. And we, Margaret and I lived in a big house then in Birmingham, where, which was the center for the fellowship's kind of life and function. Um, and it had lots of doors on a landing. And, and I said to Margaret on one occasion, I said, I would, I would love to have some color in this house. Uh, we'd been in the house two years before I, I, I was told that the, the walls and the ceiling were green. I'm colorblind, you see. So I hadn't seen these. So I said, I would love to have some bright colors. And the only thing was one, two, three, four, five. There were five doors on the first landing. And I said, I would love to have every one of those doors as a different primary color. And my patient wife, bless her, she said, all right, when you come back, we'll, we'll do it. You can have every door a different color. I really ought to kind of live in a children's nursery. I love primary colors. Um, and I was talking to Norman, and we were just chatting about things. And I was saying, when we got back, I'm going to paint these doors. And Norman, if you remember, was an artist. And he cringed and he said, no, 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 no. He said, I said, well, I'm colorblind. I can't see these other colors. And he said, you know what it's like if you stand next to somebody who can't sing in tune and you can never get used to it. It, 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 it will invade your sense of harmony all the time. You will never be able to ignore it. And I said, yes, he said, that's what you're going to do to Margaret. He said, for you, it'll be lovely and bright, and she will wince every time she goes under the landing. <laughs> so we didn't paint the doors. Uh, but it, it, what, what, the point I'm really making is that these are smoking flax is an obnoxious, acrid smell. And God says, I won't quench it. I won't count it. I'll breathe on it. I'll blow gently. I'll bring it back. I'll supply it with the oil. I'll do whatever is necessary. That's a great picture for some of these churches. Because some of them, their stench was rising to heaven. But his instinct isn't to quench. He doesn't bin things. His instinct always is to redeem and to restore and to renew. So, here he is. It says his head and his ha hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. This is 
This is a glowing, pulsating fire that he sees in the person in the shape of a human being. And he says, and his voice is the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Those seven stars will be the messengers of these seven churches. I believe me these messengers were human beings. There were people who would um, travel in between the churches, not to lay down rules and regulations, not to create any kind of hierarchy, but as part of the walking together um, the, of fellowship that the early churches had. And that would have happened in the area of Asia Minor to a certain degree. Um, it says here, uh, yes, in his right hand well, were seven stars, he says, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last. And then he begins to speak things which are particularly applicable to each one of these churches. But this is a, an amazing sign that John sees. And this book begins by speaking of the one who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood or loosed us from our sins, as some translations have. The, the one who is bringing these strong words to these seven golden lampstands, the one who is moving in their midst to trim their lamps and to supply the, the, the oil, is someone who has laid down his life for them. What I really mean is you can trust him. Uh, he, he, he's, not, he's not going to do anything to make you feel miserable um, unless that itself is therapeutic, unless that's a necessary part of the journey that you have to go. It's interesting that in these seven churches, to five of them, he says, repent. Now, how do you pronounce that word repent? There are some people maybe open air preachers and some with a certain way of understanding biblical topics who would preach it and pronounce it um, with tremendous energy. Repent! I, I don't pronounce it like that. And I don't think Jesus pronounced it like that. I think he said, repent. You see, repent is a beautiful word because when god says repent it means you're not stuck where you think you're stuck it doesn't matter how you got there it doesn't matter whose fault it was when god says repent there's a remedy available god only ever chastens those that he loves and he chastens those whom he receives God's intention for us always is only ever for our good. As our beloved Wesley said in one of his hymns, all the attributes divine are now at work for me. Now that might sound like egocentricity gone crazy, but what he's saying is that there's, there's nothing in God that is against you. Nothing. Nothing at all. All the attributes divine are now at work for you. And if he brings a strong word to you, and something that does bring you sorrow or shame, it's therapeutic, it's remedial, it's always with the purpose of putting something right. And just listen to this. It goes on, and he speaks about this church, and he says the church, let me, let me read it to you. You will know this, it's in um, Revelation chapter 3, please. Revelation chapter 3 and 4 are the two chapters which give us details of these words. This is the first one then in Revelation chapter 2. And he says this. Um, get my light so that I can see what I'm reading. To the angel, the messenger it really is, to the messenger of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Earlier on, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand 
puts his right hand upon John and raises him from his almost lifeless condition. You see, these are symbols. And if you try to use them too literally, you end up with nonsense things. What Does that mean he drops the five stars, the seven stars, when he puts his hand upon John? Of course it doesn't. These are moving pictures. He goes on to say this. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand. And then he describes himself like this. Listen, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now, when John had that first vision, he just someone who was saw someone who was in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And I guess he was just standing there. That's how it appeared. But now as he begins to speak to these churches, he's moving. He's walking. He's walking in the midst of these churches. This is an amazing per, um, picture. I don't know whether many of you have been in jobs where you've had annual appraisals at the end of the year. Or like that. And they can be nail-biting times. But the idea is, that you assess together with your line manager the, 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 the things that you ought to have done and have done and how well you've done them. And then you look forward to the next year with the things that need to be done. And if it's a good appraisal, your line manager will then say, well, what skills do you need to move into this next section of your career here? <laughs> now, when Jesus comes Actually, he doesn't do an annual repraisal. Uh, he is his is continual assessment. It was every day that the priest had to examine those lampstands, that lampstand, and make sure that it was fit for purpose. So Jesus comes daily, and grace comes daily. And as Jeremiah said, his mercies come daily, his covenant faithfulness comes daily, freshly minted. You never, have to go, you never have to go back for grace. It, it's always now. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. So here he is, and he sees, John sees, the high priest, the one whose responsibility it is to care for the lampstands. He sees this one walking in the midst and he comes to one and then another and this is the key one of the key things i want to express that that this is true for churches that there are no two churches that are the same and i know that some churches like to kind of organize themselves on a kind of a franchise method so that another church is an exact copy they call this McDonaldization as <laughs> an exact copy of the last one because they found it worked here. So they'll think we'll use that methodology here too. These churches are individual creations of God. And he puts them in unique places. So each one has a unique purpose. And he walks in the midst and he comes to this one and then to this one and to this one. And the thing is, he brings an individual, personal, handcrafted, <laughs> um, nothing off the peg, but something which is tailor made for the church of Ephesus. And then for the church at Smyrna and then for the church at Pergamos and so on, everyone handcrafted. He does say, listen to what I'm saying to the others, because that cap might fit you as well. But he doesn't use that particular language, but you know what I mean. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. If this speaks to your heart, then God is speaking to you. Do something about it. To five of the seven, the thing that they have to do is to repent and do the first work. That's what he's going to say to Ephesus. Repent and do the first works. 
repentance is, is more than a change of mind. I know that people will say, well, it's the Greek word metanoia just simply means to change the mind. I know it does. But words don't have dictionary definitions. They have histories. And although metanoia in Greek does mean to change the mind, metanoia has a history as well. But metanoia has a Hebrew history because it's been used to translate a Hebrew word for repentance into the Greek language. Now, in this instance, the Greek language isn't rich enough for the word because the Hebrew word is far richer. Metanoia, metanoia can just simply mean a change of mind, a change of view, a change of point of view, that kind of thing. The Hebrew word has a groan in it. The first time it's used in the Bible is of God himself. It repented the Lord that he had made man upon the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. That's repentance. Repentance is a change of mind, but it's a change of mind that has with it a grief of heart, a pain, a sorrow. I've not got time to develop that as I might. But if you want to, in the book of Daniel, there is the, sorry, in the book of Jonah, in chapter three, there is the story of Sargon II, almost certainly. And uh, he, according to Jesus, said the people of Nineveh repented. So if you want to know what Jesus means by repentance, you need to go back to Daniel chapter three. Read it and look at the steps of their repentance. And you'll see the ultimate thing is that the king has to abdicate. He comes off his throne. He lays aside the insignia of his control, his royal robes, and he puts on sackcloth and ashes. And real repentance isn't just a change of mind. Real repentance is repent and do. You repent and things change. Uh, you repent because you believe what God has said to you and you've responded to him. And if you respond to what God has said, then that is faith. Choosing what you believe in, that isn't faith. But if God has said something to you and you choose to believe it, that is faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So let's pursue this a little bit. He who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Uh, how about the lampstand that you are part of? Or maybe for reasons that aren't entirely your fault or maybe not your fault at all, uh, you are not actually part of a local church at this time. Uh, you haven't found those with whom you could one, walk with one accord. But that happens, sadly, in some context. But if there are those with whom you can walk together, you can make progress. If you're of like mind, then I would say be reluctant to kind of turn your back upon that. Um, John Wesley used to say, quoting his father, that the Bible, I'll put it in his language, that the Bible knows nothing about solitary religion. We need to be in fellowship. We, some of us here represent churches where that was um, our main kind of brand signature. That was our distinctive. Um, I was part of a, a fellowship in Wake Green, which was a, a, part, a part of Birmingham. And we call ourselves the Wake Green Christian Fellowship. And we used to say it's really very simple. Wake Green tells you where we are. Christian tells me who we are. And fellowship tells you what we do. Now, other things come out of that. Evangelism comes out of that. Oh, the kinds of care come out of that. But in essence, we met because we were of one mind and we found the grace of God to kindly help each other on. Let's move on. Let's move on. I know your works. Now, if this was an annual appraisal, this would be a pretty good appraisal. I know your works, your labor your patient endurance, and you cannot bear those who are evil. 
and you have tested those who say they're apostles and they're not and have found them liars and you've persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary well i mean if that was the opening of your appraisal you'd feel pretty warm feeling inside i think but you know and i know it goes on and he says nevertheless i have this against you you have left your first love i've not i'm not i haven't got the time to kind of go into but think about ephesus trace ephesus in the acts of the apostles trace ephesus in the letter to the ephesians trace ephesus in the life of paul we know that paul sent timothy to ephesus later on we know that john was resident at ephesus my ephesus must have had one of the richest heritages of any church in the known world in those days it had met, had men of pure spirit who had laid down their lives for the saints and they have much to commend them much to commend them but nevertheless i have against you that you've lost your first love remember therefore you see god bids us remember not reminisce that isn't the same thing at all <laughs> someone once said nostalgia isn't what it used to be and reminiscence isn't what it used to be either it's not a question of remembering than just for a warm fuzzy feeling remember and what does he want them to remember well he says remember therefore from whence you are fallen and now you get some folks who say Oh, just shake. Samson did this. Just shake yourself. It'll be all right. Just shake it off and just crash on. Just go and do the next thing. You'll be fine. Don't worry about the past. Just keep moving on. God says, remember. Remember, there have been key events, key steps, key Bethels in your life that were a house of God to you, where God made his presence real and you knew something. Remember remember the times when you've been conscious of god's presence he goes on to say this remember therefore from whence you've fallen and we never fall upwards brothers and sisters whatever else we may acquire whatever skills we may acquire you never fall upwards remember from whence you are fallen and repent and do the first works or else i will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you respond you repent now i want to kind of expound something i want to try and explain something as i understand it i don't read there that he says he will destroy the lampstand the lampstand is god's creation if my understanding of things that are gold have that implication he doesn't say he'll do that what he says is he'll move it He'll move it from the place where that testimony has been burning bright. If we are not faithful to what God has entrusted to us, then he will move it on. He will move it to another place where the testimony will build, will burn bright. And, and this isn't an act of outrage. This isn't God punishing. This is simply God ensuring that the testimony will be maintained, that the light will burn, that there will be this unique testimony to God's workings in this place. And that's an interesting thing. You know that one of the things that John sees is he sees seven spirits before the throne of God. Now, we know that there's only one spirit, but seven is a number of fullness or completeness. So this is a picture, if you like, of the, the wonderful full, fullness of the spirit. And he expresses it here in terms of seven spirits. Now, what does that say to me? I won't kind of implicate 
you in this. You can listen to it and tell me what you think later. I think each of these lampstands, although it burns with the same light and is cared for by the same high priest, I think each one of them has a unique capacity and a unique purpose. I think God gives churches a unique testimony. I could do it now. I could go through some testimonies, some churches that you would know, and I would say, and the unique testimony, the prevailing, the distinctive of that particular church was they did this, or they did this, or they did this, or they did this. The Holy Spirit is, well, he is the creator. He is full of creativity. He doesn't need to do, he doesn't need to operate on the pattern of McDonaldization, you know, just kind of take another one and do it here. What he does is unique. Let me tell you very briefly, I'm going on longer than I intended, but let me just say this very briefly. Many years ago, I, I went to um, St. Lincoln's College just for the day in Oxford. And what they have there is they have a room that they have kitted out as a, a facsimile, if you like, or as a, a, a way of Wesley's rooms when he was a fellow there. Um, and there's, there's, it, it, there are kind of books around and there's kind of chairs and things. And there's a kind of a stable door so that you can kind of lean over the door and be in Wesley's studio without actually going into it. And I was there one day and um, I think I was taking someone to see. I often take people. I remember Robert and I went there to see Wesley's study. Um, and um, I looked at this and thought about the gift of John Wesley and Charles Wesley. And then there was a little book by the side where the people who visited, you you know, you signed the visitor's book and you put a little comment, et cetera. And I, and I thought this and I came out and I thought about what he'd done. And I wrote in the comment section, I wrote, do it again, Lord, with a big exclamation mark. And as I walked down the stairs away from the room, I felt God speak so clearly to my heart. And he said, I never repeat myself. I am the origin. Everything that I do is original. He doesn't want another Moses. He's got Joshua. He doesn't want another Joshua. He's got somebody else. It, is, it isn't a question of finding someone to fill somebody else's shoes. God never does the same thing twice. It may look superficially as though it's the same thing but he hasn't made two blades of grass the same. Why should he make two fellowships the same? Why should that happen? So each fellowship will have my, I've got a cup of tea arriving here. Thank you. Mine's just been off. <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so what, what I'm saying is, we don't have to be a carbon copy of somebody else. We don't have to have a fellowship standard way of doing things. Not, but we do have to cherish the thing that God has put into our hearts with which he's entrusted us. We are stewards. I know that people will feel that in different measures. Um, some people will feel a definite burden of stewardship that God has given them something to do something to not to become kind of obsessed with it in such a way that it becomes a kind of a, a brazen serpent to us, but that to understand that God trusts us to things and then he holds us accountable for the things that he's put into our hands. So he says to the church here at Ephesus, repent and do the first works. And it's because they've lost something. They've got, they've got this whole list of these wonderful attributes and these achievements that they've made over the years. And, you know, the list of famous people who've come there and done wonderful things is almost endless. But he says, repent and do the first things. Now, 
what does he have in mind? Well, let me take you back now to Jeremiah. This is, I'm going back to Jeremiah chapter 2. So we've been in Revelation chapter 2, and now we're going back to Jeremiah chapter 2. Because Jerusalem is the awe from which these truths are brought to the church at Ephesus. This is the thing about the book of the Revelation. It's like a Clapham Junction. All kinds of things flow into it and shoot off in other directions. It's a, it is so rich and so dependent upon the Old Testament. And this is what um, it says in chapter 2 of Jeremiah. Moreover, the word of Jehovah came to me, saying, Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says Jehovah, I remember you. Do you remember I told you that God is completely in control of what he remembers? This is, this is God speaking to Jerusalem, and he's speaking to Jerusalem against the background of an impending disaster that's coming upon the nation and the city and its priesthood and its monarchy. But at the same time, God remembers something here. And just listen to this. He says, I remember you. The kindness, that's the word hesed, which really means covenant faithfulness. I, this is God speaking to Jerusalem, but behind Jerusalem is speaking to Israel as a nation. I remember you, the covenant love of your youth, the love of your betrothal. When you went after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown, Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him will offend. Disaster will come upon you. I'll read on a little bit. Hear the word of Jehovah, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says Jehovah, what injustice have your fathers found in me? that they have gone far from me and have followed idols and become idolaters. Neither did they say, where is the Lord? This, this is a tragic thing. Where is the Lord? They hadn't even missed him. He was no longer with them. He was no longer speaking to them in the ways that he had. Soon his presence would no longer be in the most holy place, the Shekinah would go and never return. Neither did they say, where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt, the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land that no one crossed and where no one dwelt. I brought you into a bountiful country to eat its fruit and its goodness. When you entered in, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. And the priests did not say, where is the Lord? Business as usual. It's so easy for churches to carry on with business as usual. And yet the essential essence that makes a church a church is God in the midst when Moses was pleading with God for Israel and God said all right I will not destroy the nation um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to send my angel he will lead you I'm not coming with you and in these are my own words. And Moses said, no. The thing that makes us who we are is your presence with us. If we don't have your presence with us, we have no distinctive. We have no purpose. There's no point in our lives. Leave us here. If you're not going to come with us, leave us here. There's no point in us going anywhere. 
that's an astonishing statement. And even more astonishing as we kind of realize as we read around that area that Moses actually offered to be a substitute for the whole nation's rebellion so that God could be with them always. Of course, God didn't grant that request for Moses. There was another who was going to fulfill that request, who would take our place and turn aside the curse and open up for us a promise of blessing. But it's an amazing statement. This thing, the thing that makes us who we are is God is in the midst. I've got nobody in mind when I say this, I promise you. It has nothing to do with numbers. It has nothing to do with the brilliance of the music. It has nothing to do. It has to do with God's presence in the midst. This is 30 years after Peter and Paul and people like Timothy have died. And who knows what's happened to Ephesus in 30 years? Who knows what's happened to your golden lampstand in 30 years? But I know that in his faithfulness, the Lord comes from time to time and does an on the spot appraisal in order to redeem and to recreate and to start again. And listen to what this goes on to say. Because God is very specific as to what his charges are against Jerusalem and the people of Israel. This is verse 9. Therefore, I will yet bring charges against you, says the Lord, and against your children's children, I will bring charges. Um, I'm looking for the, oh, there we go. Um, for pass beyond the coasts of Cyprus and see, send to Kedar and consider diligently and see if there has been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods? My people have changed their glory for what does not profit. Be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord. And then he's very specific, and he says this. My people, and remember, this is only if the cap fits. My people have committed two evils. Two. Here's the first one. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. God's indictment against the people of Israel was that they had turned their back on a him, but were carrying on with the its. They were going through the motions. They were doing all the right things at one level, but really they turned their back on God. Paul writes to the Galatians and he says, I'm amazed. I'm, I'm shocked that you're turning away so fast from him to an it to another gospel. Things can happen very quickly. William Booth used to say to his officers, it is in the nature of a fire to go out unless it is tended. That's a sobering thing, brothers and sisters. In your life and my life, in our church's manifestation of the life of God in our unique setting, it is in the nature of a fire to go out unless it's tended. Now, we have someone who will tend the lampstand. If it doesn't repent, he'll move it. And he'll give that testimony to another place, to another people, to another purpose. And that's the first thing. They'd forsaken God. Did you know the second thing? Here it is. And they have hewn themselves systems, broken systems, which can hold no water. They had turned to other methodologies. When God brought the people in to the promised land as he was bringing them in, he said through Moses to them, he said, the land I'm going to bring you into will not be like Egypt, where you watered your gardens with your foot. And you think, well, what's that about? Well, 
Egypt, of course, they call it the gift of the Nile. And because the, the priests way up river could actually measure the water, they could time to the day when Egypt's floods would come. It was all wonderfully predictable so that they could make their little rivulets, do their irrigation systems, digging their heel, but blocking up the ends until the flood came and then they could open up the little ends and it could go everywhere. And God speaks to them as um, watering their, um, their herbs, he says. I often think about herbs, most people, maybe Tudor herbs, mostly in straight lines. Um, they're usually in, um, it's all ordered. It's all wonderfully ordered, everything in its right place. And that's the way it is. And that's what it had been like in Egypt. And God said, it's not going to be like that in the land that I'm taking you to. The land I'm taking you to receives its rain from heaven. Brothers and sisters, these broken systems, they can hold no water. These new themes and new streams and new this and new that, either we receive our water from heaven or we don't. And if we don't, well, we're told very plainly in the Old Testament what we can do about it. We pray. And we come back. Let me go on back to the book of Revelation, and I'm going to stop very soon now. And if she's still listening, my wonderful life when she brought, wife when she brought me my cup left the door open. So it's really very fresh here at the bottom of the garden. I'll just mention that so she can go and close it if she wants to. <laughs> but this is, um, this is Revelation. Listen, let me read on. Here she is. I knew she'd come. <laughs> he says, remember therefore from whence you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this I have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. I'm not going to go into that. And then he says this. This is amazing. He who has an ear. In Ephesus, in Reading, in Bracknell, in Birmingham, wherever you are. He who has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Is it possible when things have become jaded, is it possible when we've lost something of that kind of excitement is it possible when it seems so long ago, is it possible for God to restore pristine Edenic conditions as it was at the very beginning? Apparently it is. That's what he said here to everyone who has an ear to hear. Here it is. It's symbolic, of course, but listen to it. To him who gives, who comes, who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Yeah. <laughs> this is why I said that God doesn't really reverse things. He appraises and wonderfully. He repairs things in a way which makes them new. Jeremiah is the man who went down to the potter's house and he saw the potter working in the wheel. And God said to him, I can do with you as God did with this potter. And Jeremiah had seen the potter at the wheel and he described it. And it says, and as he was working at the wheel, 
the pot was marred. It's a strong word, ruined. The pot was marred in the hands of the potter. And then it says this. So he made it again. Another vessel. As it had pleased him. Not the same vessel, but another vessel of God's own working, of God's own hand, of pure gold, as it pleases him. It doesn't matter whether as individuals or as gatherings of God's people, if we get track off track, if we get off the flight path, it only needs genuine repentance for God to instantly put us back onto his track for us. It's a wonderful thing at the end of the year, just to remember briefly as God brings them to mind, perhaps some of the things that might have been, but at the same thing to look to God, acknowledging that if God is not with us, there's no point. If he's entrusted something to us, he will hold us accountable. But even if as individuals or as churches, we become broken, marred, ruined in the hands of God, that's not the end of the story. Because God has a wonderful word, repent. It means you can start all over again. I'm going to pray with us all, if that's all right, and I'll stop. Father, if this is a presumptuous word to bring to my brothers and sisters, I pray their forgiveness and their tolerance, Lord. I know, Lord, that... Many of us have experienced days at the right hand of God, glorious days. And sometimes, long, Lord, we have lost some of those things and have no idea as to how to retrieve them. So we won't try and retrieve them. We won't try and reverse them. We won't try and repair them. We'll come to you, Lord, and we'll say, Lord, please start again. Just make us again another vessel in the hands of the potter as it pleases you. And thank you, Lord, for this thrilling promise that we don't have to settle for second best, but we can have a new beginning which gives us access to the tree of life in the garden. I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray, Lord, for all the things that are going through our hearts and minds that we're having to process and wonder about in these days. I pray, Lord, that you will give us hope and faith and enable us to come to you, Lord, with confidence, believing this, that we are to come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may find mercy and discover grace that runs to the sound of our cry at the point of need. Lord, you know what you will do. You know us. You know every heart. You know every twist and turn of our minds. You know. Come and speak your word into our heart, Lord, and fulfill my brother's prayer, the word of grace that builds up the saints. Come and do your work in us, Lord, and glorify our Lord Jesus.